to, to making that happen. And the, uh, the measurements are not all in the same measuring system, of course, and, uh, but really an incredible place to, to live and work off the planet. Uh, we, we say we're in microgravity up there because we're still actually, Earth's gravity is still pulling on us, so the um, way I think of, the, of us floating around is we're in a constant state of free fall. So we either did a free fall before, that's kind of the constant state we're in, so it's pretty cool to uh, have that environment, but also very challenging to do daily activities and to try to work in something like that. Uh, you see on the right side of your screen there the giant solar rays just for scale. Those are about 100 yards long, so 300 feet long. Um, there's some, if you look on the far right, there's two little tiny solar rays that are kind of overlapping the, the ones on the right. Um, those are two that Tama and I actually um, installed on this last mission a few years ago. Um, kind of in the middle of the space station at the top, there's a white spacecraft there, and that's our Crew Dragon. So that's the one that I flew up and commanded and got to kind of connect to the very front of the space station there. Another challenging thing, right, when you're trying to bring two things together going 17,000 plus miles an hour, not, not super simple, um, but we have incredible teams on the ground, obviously they're helping us do that. Uh, you may see the robotic arm kind of sticking up there on the left uh, top of your screen there, and uh, other models are, are all up there. You know, that's over the coast of Africa there, so really a cool shot. So a lot of people are asking me this, how did you take that picture? <laughs> Anybody have any ideas? I think I heard a satellite, no? Well, we weren't on an untethered spacewalk, so that's not, not a, a game player there either. So what happens every now and then, uh, we only have a certain number of docking ports on the space station. We have two on the U.S. side, two on the Russian side. And every now and then we have to kind of move to a different docking port. Um, so that the next vehicle can come up to the space station. So that's what happened here. One of the Russian vehicles had to relocate, so they pulled out a little bit, took this incredible picture, um, and so that's, we didn't make this up or it wasn't fake, but that's a real picture that the cosmonauts took um, when they were floating around. All right, here's the, here's the amazing crew, and so I show you some pretty cool stuff, uh, the space station, of course, uh, and the p cool pictures we get to take, but. If you didn't know it, space, just like your work, is a people business, all right? And so it's all about people, it's all about relationships. Uh, the training we go through um, to even get to the level of being on a crew is pretty fantastic. We have trainers all around the world that are training us. Uh, this is my incredible crew too here. Everybody here was a, a veteran space flyer, so it made my job pretty easy. Honestly, Megan was our pilot um, on the left of your screen. We had Tama from France, Aki from Japan, and myself. So, an incredibly international crew going to the International Space Station. Uh, we trained for about a year uh, before this SpaceX flight going up there, which is about normal these days. Uh, the Russian flights that I flew on prior to that, we trained about two and a half years with the Russian crews, but uh, now it's about a year to 18 months to go to space. And so if you think about, you know, especially as a commander in this case for myself, I've got to get all these different human beings, different cultures that they come from, um, trained and ready to go to be a highly functioning, effective team, um, not just during our training, but uh, off the planet as well. So a lot of different dynamics go in there. Um, we, uh, we, you know, you see us typically on TV as the crew, but we are such a small piece of this entire space station team. Uh, and you guys all have huge teams, I know as well, but uh, we couldn't do what we do, certainly without our families, without the mission control teams around the world, with all the people that trained us leading up to the mission. I mean, so you're talking our teams and the thousands of people um, from, again, all over the world that are, are counting on us to do the right thing, for one, uh, because of the incredible training they gave us. Um, and so if there's a failure, you know, there could be a failure. We're humans, right? We're going to fail at some point up there. And hopefully we have things that are built in to catch those failures, for one. Uh, but there's also failures in our process. Our processes, when they, especially when they cross um, kind of space agencies, gets a little muddy and messy sometimes. And we've got to be ready for that. And as the, the commander of, of either a crew like this or the, the commander of the International Space Station, that person has got to be ready to kind of um, drive, drive the ship, so to speak, as the crew, so that we can continue to do effective work no matter what's going on on the ground. So, and those things happen. Um, we've had uh, several failures last time when we were up there, which weren't very comforting to my wife, I know. Um, one of those, let me just tell you, it's kind of a failure, I think, um, in, a, in a, lot of, a lot of levels, but the Russians were sending up a brand new module, it's an incredible laboratory they were very proud of, 
Uh, they're only about 10 years behind, so run on par for now. But, uh, but, I mean, this thing was, it was an incredible addition to the space station, but once it launched, it had all kind of issues on the way up. So it took a couple of days to get to the space station, and the integrity of the vehicle, honestly, was, was in doubt, meaning that the fuel and the oxidizer lines, our engineers thought that those were compromised, and of course, if those cross, the thing blows up. So um, the, the danger was this thing gets to the space station, blows up, obviously not good. And so, you know, on our side of the space station, we're like, well, there's no way they're gonna let this thing come to the space station. Well, after us talking with our ground teams and the flight directors and mission control, um, it was very clear the decision was not up to them and the Russians were coming. Um, and so if that was an American vehicle, honestly, we would have dumped it in the ocean and, and forgot about it and tried it again. Um, but it was, so, it was a really strange time up there. The cosmonauts weren't, for a company there, and, but their, their, their agency was. Um, and so it was a weird time. So decisions like that get made, I'm sure, in your, your world all the time too. So what do you do as the leader? Well, in my case, I'm like, okay, this thing is definitely coming. How can I keep these four individuals as safe as possible? And so we talked through lots of scenarios and what, what we ended up doing is we just all got in our capsule, all in our spacesuits, and if this thing came and blew up, we were gonna undock and come home. Now, we were gonna be fine. The problem was the Russian crew that was up there, which had two Russians and an American on it, their vehicle was parked right next to where this thing was supposed to dock. Okay, so if this thing docked and blew up, guess what? Their vehicle was gonna be destroyed. And that, the good news is we could keep them on our side and keep them safe, but they had no way to get home. So um, the way we mitigated all that risk was we brought that crew all the way over kind of where we were, closed all the hatches in between, and just kind of got ready for this terrible situation that it was about to happen. Now, guess what? It docked, everything seemed to be fine, everybody's rejoicing, um, we start doing our work again, about an hour after this thing docks, and it's mechanically connected with hooks to the space station, it starts firing its engines like it's leaving, all right, like it's departing, even though it's connected to the space station. So, that caused us some serious issues. So, that caused the space station to start tumbling out of control. Um, we, you couldn't see it unless you were near a window, and we couldn't feel it on the space station, but all the alarms are going off. Mission Control calls us, tells us to get in these procedures, and solve this thing, like, ASAP. So, that was what we got to do for the next few hours, um, is fix this issue with the, with the Russian computers and shut them down, and, and then get the space station kind of settled in. Um, now we could talk for days about all the failures in the processes and the decision makers on the ground, but um, again, at some point you just got to get to work, um, I'll say is the way we did it, and solve the problem. So we got to do that, and uh, it was kind of cool, you know, we got to debrief it, and guess what, about a month later, we decided to do the same thing again, um, unfortunately. So we were ready, of course the families are getting called, and the call they get is, hey, just want to let you know, the space station's out of control. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what's going on. Uh, just hang in there. <laughs> and so that's not a great call. But, uh, but when you got people like this on your team and you, you kind of built that rapport with the, with the mission control teams and your crewmates through your training and through all the experiences you've had leading up to this, then it becomes kind of, uh, I won't say not a problem, but it just makes the whole situation that much easier, especially when you know how confident these people are. Um, when we got to the space station, there were other people there, so you see a bunch of people here. This is not usual. Typically, there's a crew of seven, there's four that come up on SpaceX and three on the Russian vehicle. Um, but every now and then, you'll overlap with the crew for a week or two before they're heading out. So it's really fun to fly with, um, you know, a lot of people. So we're hanging out, floating around the dinner table here. Um, you may see that the dinner table has a bunch of duct tape and Velcro, and that's how we keep things on the dinner table. Right, and not floating around. So meals are always fun and just tossing food around and, and enjoying company. Um, 10 people, 11 people is a lot of people on the space station. It's really fun for a day or two. It's kind of like house guests, right? Um, but then it's like, we were like, hey, can I help you pack your bags? You guys need to get out of here. Uh, because we don't have enough sleep stations. There's only one toilet, right? There's only one, one workout machine and all these logistics things that we're kind of literally waiting in line to go to the bathroom. What is going on? There's too many people up here. So, uh, but again, we got to share some cool times with them. And that picture, I, mean, it's, I think it's an awesome picture because there's so many, I mean, there's Russians, Japanese, French, Americans in that picture. And it just shows the incredible 
international cooperation we have in the space program, which obviously is not necessarily going on on our planet right now. So um, this has been a nice, great example, I think, for, for all of society that, that we can all work together and accomplish amazing things um, off the planet. Hopefully we can translate that down to the planet one of these days. Uh, here's a cool picture that a photographer took from the ground of, the, of us on the space station transiting the moon. Um, just a time lapse there as we went across the moon. That was pretty neat. That's one of those sunrises I was talking about. I, just got, I was lucky enough to capture it kind of right at that moment where the sun's peeking through. And uh, the sunrise event happens in you know seconds, like 10 to 15 seconds, where it's again pitch dark, minus 200, to pure bright, plus 200 degrees. Here's a cool view kind of out of our windows that we get to see going around the Earth. Those are thunderstorms that you see um, that were flying above. You see the stars, if you can see those up at the top coming out. But it's a pretty fantastic view um, when you get a chance to look out the window. All right, you guys know what those are? Auroras, right? Is that, are those northern lights or southern lights? Anybody know? I heard a bunch of grumbling. All right, those are northern lights, and I only know that because that's Ireland kind of in the, the lower right corner. You see Dublin there. Um, and so we got some fantastic views of auroras on this last mission. I mean, they were abundant, like way more than I'd ever seen before. So we got the chance to take some incredible pictures and videos. And a lot of times we actually felt like we were flying right through them. So it just was mind-blowing um, having that perspective. There's another, I think, cool shot of one. And then here's a video that kind of shows you, again, the perspective we have um, as an aurora comes up. special to experience it. I definitely miss those views. All right, let me talk about some spacewalks real quick. As you heard um, during the introduction, I've done a few of those. And spacewalking is, is uh, the most dangerous thing we certainly ask an astronaut to do, where you're, you're putting somebody outside a perfectly good spacecraft to go into the vacuum of space. Extremely um, unforgiving environment out there, I guess is the best way to put it. These spacesuits weigh about 300 pounds. All right, so think about that. What do they weigh in space? Zero, they don't weigh anything, but it's a 300 pound mass that you have to move around and control. All right, they're also pressurized, and so we get in them, they pressurize us, meaning they blow us up, so it makes the space be very stiff. And so just moving around, and it takes exercise and work on your body. Um, just opening and closing your hands takes work because you're fighting the pressure of that spacesuit even when you're grabbing everything. So, we call it spacewalking, as I think you know, but we don't do anything with our feet. It's, uh, we do everything with our hands, we move around with our hands, we uh, fix things with our hands, dry bolts and those kind of things. So uh, all that stuff in the front of me there, you see, those are all kind of the tools that I was gonna need for that day. Uh, when we go outside, we go outside for about six and a half, seven hours at a time. Uh, we don't always get to go out, so it's, uh, you know, it's, I've been again fortunate enough to do nine of these, but uh, sometimes you can get up there for six months and not get to go outside, even though you've been trained. So my feet right now are hanging out in space. Um, they're, they're through the hatch there as I'm getting ready to head out and do this spacewalk. And these were uh, when Tom and I went out to install these brand new solar arrays on the last mission. Those suits are, are old, honestly. They are space shuttle kind of era suits. And so we, honestly, NASA needs new space suits, which we're working really hard on. But um, we realize it is a very tough thing to design and make a space suit that can uh, withstand the, the kind of the hazards of space flight. And so uh, these are very capable, but again, they're aging. They're probably 30 to 40 years old now in most cases. And so we, we need new suits. And as we go back to the moon, I'll talk about here in a minute, we're gonna have new suits for that. All right, so this is the solar array. This is me holding it here. So I felt super strong. I'm holding a 750 pound solar array. Feeling pretty good about myself. Um, the problem was I had to sit here for 45 minutes and hold this thing. Uh, while Tama was uh, seeing anything around. He was doing other things on the robotic arm and he had to get that put away and then come out and join me before I could hand it off and we could install it. 
Uh, the problem with that was you think, oh, I can just hold this thing because it doesn't you know, really weigh anything for 45 minutes. But guess what? As we're going around the Earth really fast, of course, um, the space station kind of stays in the same um, you know, attitude as it goes around the Earth. Well, this thing doesn't want to do that. It wants to, it wants to kind of rise up. And so I have to kind of manually do that. And that became very physically challenging. Uh, we'd never done this before. This is the first time we tried to install these new solar arrays, and so we learned a lot. Uh, and how crazy hard that was to sit there for 45 minutes. I could not wait for Tamar to get out there and help me out. I think I have a shot here. You're outside, so you gotta do a space selfie, of course. Um, so that's what that is. Um, but again, a good time. Again, it's really hard work. It's not just hard work physically, but I would say it's even more mentally challenging out there. Is you're focused, laser focused on everything you touch, every handrail you're gonna grab, Every piece of equipment better have a tether on it, and you may be changing tethers throughout that. Um, you better be tethered to, to something at all times. And then all that stuff is just mentally taxing. Um, we've been trained really, really well from the teams on the ground. But if you think about this, all the people on the ground that train us to do spacewalks or to do anything in space, none of them have ever been in space, right? Isn't that crazy? Uh, but it's, a, it's actually a great system we have, and of course, when people come back, they tell them, hey, this was right, this was not. So they, they've learned over the years kind of the tricks of the trade, but it's kind of a, a pretty crazy um, dynamic that we have at NASA for training. Um, I think I have a little, this is coming up here, I just want to show you a little highlight video of our mission. Hopefully it'll give you a flavor for what it's like to live and work off the planet on this incredible laboratory called the International Space Station. For any of you here that have long hair, you're going to love Megan's hair. Pretty fantastic in space. Taking care of our planet 
is kind of going to change maybe mentally from seeing it from this perspective. We are growing some chili peppers in the plant habitat here in the Japanese experiment module. It's one of the more complicated things that have been grown in space, and so they do take a little longer to come to fruition. So we're really hoping that we get to try some peppers before the end of our mission. <laughs> Over the years, the capabilities of the laboratory have expanded and grown along with the interest in doing this kind of research in lower Earth orbit, which I think is really remarkable. So we are really kind of at the peak of that, I think. And so we've seen a little bit of everything, right? We've done um, human immune system research, so lots of research into medication formation, um, fluids research, combustion research, even robotics research, this huge range of different things that we've gotten to touch during our mission. And the way science works, as you know, is this is the building blocks for stuff to come. And so the res results from these experiments will come out in the years to come, but they will also be the foundation of experiments that are designed in the following years. And so all of the research is gonna be stuff that we get to say, oh, we have a little part of that. We got, we got our hands on a little bit of that, which is a pretty neat feeling. Endeavor, SpaceX is go for the orbit, entry and landing. Captain, go for the orbit, entry and landing. cheering before we touched down, and that's because that fourth parachute had just opened, <laughs> so they were, that's why they were cheering. Um, but let me just kind of set the stage a little bit on what's going on with NASA. If you didn't know, tomorrow is supposed to be a launch about uh, just before 11 a.m. of the very first Boeing launch with people on it. So Boeing and SpaceX both won the contract for the U.S. several years ago now. Um, SpaceX has obviously been flying us for several years, and Boeing is um, a little a little slower to the game, so to speak. But we're hoping they have a test flight with uh, two astronauts on it tomorrow morning. They've been delayed, if you haven't seen it, for years, um, unfortunately. In the last several months, they've had launch attempts where the crew strapped in and they scrubbed right before launch, unfortunately. That happened last weekend as well, so we're hoping tomorrow's the day for them. And if that goes successful, then we're, we, the U.S., will have two spacecraft, Boeing and SpaceX, that can deliver our astronauts to the space station. Space Station is going to be around probably for the next few years. Uh, right now, we want to, we NASA want to keep it out till 2030. So that'll be here pretty quickly. And then I'm not sure what's going to happen. If nobody kind of takes it over as a private company, then we will deorbit that end of the Pacific. Uh, Russians are only committed out to 2028 right now, so we've got to work through those issues. Uh, but hopefully, we'll be flying uh, up through 2030. Um, the rest of the, the decade is really geared about going back to the moon. And so the Artemis program, if you haven't heard that, is the, the missions that will be going back to the moon. We're waiting to fly our first crew on the Artemis um, Orion vehicle, and that'll happen probably in late 25, so about a year and a half from now. They'll get to go fly around the moon, and then all the missions after that will be going down to the surface and building habitats and be having a permanent presence on the moon. So unlike what we did back in the 60s and 70s, they're just going there for a few days and popping off, we're actually going to build infrastructure and actually have to 
think about power and how do we store power, how do we distribute power, that kind of stuff on the surface of the moon. So hopefully that kind of sets you up for what's going on, at least on the government side of space, as I'm sure you heard. Private companies are going like crazy now, and there's all kind of things that they are doing, and some of those are participating with NASA and the other um, space agencies in getting, that, getting the mission to the moon done and being a part of that, uh, as well as the International Space Station. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. If you guys have any, I'd love it to see what's on your mind. So um, either, I think there's some mics coming around, but if not, just shout it out, and I'll try to repeat it for everybody. Did China land on the dark side of the moon? Um, yeah, they just landed, I think I saw today or yesterday, maybe they landed. I don't know the location, that's a good question of where they landed on the moon, but I saw they put their, I think their first lander there. In, in the it was successful, yeah. But that's, that's, that's a great question, right? Was it successful? Well, we think it is because that's what we're hearing in the news, right? Um, they probably won't tell us if it, if it didn't do well, that's my guess. What else? What else? What do you think about uh, UFO over here? UFOs and like life outside of Earth. Uh, I, I have never seen a UFO personally, so I, you know, I don't know if I believe it or not believe it. There's obviously been a lot of stuff in the news in the last year or two that you know a lot of military pilots are swearing they see them. And I can't deny that they saw whatever they saw, but uh, I personally haven't seen it. You know, hopefully. Your know, second part of the question, I hope there's something out there, and I hope we discover it. I mean, that's, that would be kind of cool to, to see if there's another Earth or something else like that out there, but um, you know, currently we don't have any indication that there is. All right, way back. Uh, what is your favorite space movie, and what is the most accurate? And please tell me it's Armageddon for both times. <laughs> I think it shows, it shows kind of all aspects of the mission. It shows the, the astronauts, of course. It shows the family side. It shows the incredible mission control team that actually saves their life. It shows all the work going on behind the scenes to get this crew in this crazy situation um, out alive. So I think it's a really good job there. I love um, The Martian. I love it's, it's not super accurate all the time, but I love that movie as well. Uh, but the one that's most accurate that I love the most is Apollo 13. Yep. I have a question. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like when you come home after you've been up there? Yeah, um, so your body has definitely gone through. So that last mission I was on, when we splashed down, we've been in space for 200 days. Uh, so that was a long mission, and your body does pay a price of it. Uh, we work out quite a bit on the space station, so we're actually very strong when we get back. You're very lean and strong, but your coordination, your sense of balance is all whacked up. Your inner ears, like, where, what's going on? Like, what is this gravity thing? So it takes a day or two, generally for astronauts, and everybody will have a different story, but about a day or two for those kind of, you know, uneasy feeling walking around. I felt like when I was walking, I felt like I was stumbling around, but I saw a video of myself and it looked completely normal. So again, it's your brain trying to figure it out as well. Um, we, do, we do some funny things when we get home. Um, we break a lot of glasses and plates, okay? Because we're used to letting things go, and expecting them to stay right there. But it turns out that doesn't happen on Earth. Um, so Robbie last time had paper plates and plastic cups. Nice, nice. Um, and then you have generally you have lower back pain for a month to two months generally because in space, guess what? You grow two inches, which is finally hit six feet. Super proud of myself. Because um, your spine just expands. There's nothing holding it down. But when you come home, you pay the price. Um, your, the bottoms of your feet after a couple days get really sore. That your rear end gets very sore because you literally haven't sat down in six or eight, seven months, um, or you haven't walked in that long. So it's just weird things like that happen in your body. But uh, we have an incredible team um, in the gym that kind of trainers that post through these uh, rehabilitation programs. And after it's a 45-day program, but after a couple of weeks, generally. You're um, they don't. They, they don't let us drive generally for a couple of weeks too because your your perception's a little off and uh, you, you hit a lot of curves and things like that. So <laughs> not super safe. Yeah. You have to worry about space debris. Space debris is that what you asked? Yes. Okay. Yeah, space debris is a big deal. Uh, I don't want to diminish that at all. But thank goodness for us, most of that is way above our altitude. So it's in the 800, 1,000 mile range above Earth. Um, where all the satellites hang out. That's where most of that stuff is. 
And so on the space station, we'll have maybe a handful of potential, they call conjunctions, maybe in a year. And so there's a couple things we can do. If we find out early enough, Mission Control can actually move the space station out of the way to keep us safe. If it's late in the game, which it kind of normally is, they'll just put us either in a, a safest module of the space station or tell us to get in our vehicles and just kind of hang out and see if anything hits. Is anything, no matter how big it is, it could be the size of a baseball or a rocket body, if it hits the space station going 17,500 miles an hour, it's going to be a bad day. And so we have to be prepared for that. Now, if you think about when we go back to the moon, those astronauts are going to have to fly through all of that debris somehow. And so that's just another thing that we've got to plan and plan it correctly so that the uh, that spacecraft can actually descend and get through kind of that debris field to get to the moon. Thank you. Yeah, can you uh, talk about your Army career to the NASA career? What were the key inflection points that took you to NASA? Yeah, super honored to serve our country in the Army for 26 years. Uh, about half of that time was at NASA. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, in my Army career, um, as you heard in the introduction, I was an Apache pilot. Um, got to command um, a couple companies at that level. And after your command time, which is about six, seven years in the Army, you have a couple of years to kind of do something different. And my different was go to graduate school um, at Georgia Tech. And then after that, kind of paying back to the Army is I went and taught at West Point. So not something I wanted to do. I was kicking and screaming the whole way because I wanted to get flying again and shooting stuff like I'd like done my whole Army career. But going back to West Point and, and teaching for a couple of years was uh, probably the most rewarding tour I ever had because you're actually pouring into the next generation of leaders in the military. Um, so it was really rewarding for me, um, and it's, you know, you, I was teaching whatever, but really you're teaching them how to be a leader and a leader of character in the Army. So that was really fun for me. Got to coach the baseball team too, that was super fun um, for a couple of years. And from there I got called to go to NASA. I had applied for that selection um, in 2000. I did not get selected, but I was kind of on some highly qualified list, and the, the Army people at NASA said, hey, we'd like you to come down there and work for a few years. And, really becomes like a couple year interview process. And then eventually I got selected, as you heard earlier, in 2004. So that's kind of how that, that worked out. And then getting to NASA, I mean, if you get to fly in space, of course, that's why we all go there if you're an astronaut. But these days, flying once or twice is, is a great career. And, and I got super lucky to fly three times on three different vehicles. So uh, that was pretty unique and very fun. And, uh, and then Robbie said, you're done. That's it. No more. So, yeah. In the back, sorry. Yes, you talked about the drastic temperature change. Uh, can you tell us what kind of HVAC unit you're running? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do not know the specifics on that. Let me tell you, that system has gotten better and better over the years of my time there uh, on the space station. So when I went up on the space shuttle and we opened the hatch of the space station, you know what it smelled like? It smelled like a locker room, like a you know, nasty locker room, right? Um, but the systems have gotten better and better over time, and now when we went up last time, we couldn't even, there was like no smell. So the system's gotten better. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah, you talked about the physical challenges of returning to Earth, and I'm wondering what the social emotional challenges are, like if there's a sort of culture shock coming back to life on Earth. Um, the biggest thing I, I noticed on this last one, a friend of mine, a couple days after I went home, he's like, hey, I want to take you to the Houston Rockets game, basketball game. I'm like, sweet, let's go. Yeah, I got in there, and I, my brain was like, what is happening? Like, it was just sensory overload, you know, with all the lights and the noise and the people. That was a weird kind of acc acclimation that I was not expecting. And so I think we've just been kind of isolated for so long, you know, in a way, and then to be exposed to that many people at one time was a bit overwhelming. Um, other than that, I mean, Robbie can probably answer better than I do, but I think I'm fairly normal after coming back, but I'm sure there, <laughs> I'm sure there are things that I was doing that, that were not so normal. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, because we literally were, you know, every day from 7.30 to 7.30 for over six months, our day was scheduled out for us. Like, they, we were getting told what to do all the time. So, when you come out of that, and you're so wired to, like, be ready to do something, that's a big adjustment for a lot of people. Um, they do give us, I would say, time off when you get back, uh, up to about six months where you have to, I mean, you're, you're obviously doing some debriefs and medical testing and all that, but once you get through the first couple of months after being home, you get several months, I would say, to be off. 
And the problem with a lot of my colleagues is they don't take that time off. Uh, and so they go, they go back to work because they think that's gonna get them on another flight quicker, and that's not the case at all. Um, and I, so as I'm mentoring people, younger astronauts, I'm like, take that time. You will never get that time again. And it's really important, I think, to take that time, reconnect with your family, your friends, uh, whatever your social piece of that was, uh, before you really jump back in and work in. So, I don't know if that answers your question. But here. Right. Shane, I think we have time for one more question. All right, one more. So we're back here with Peter. So, I just had one for the, the hot and cold part of it. Uh, is it different in space suit when you're space walking than it is in the space station? Yeah, it's definitely different. The spacesuit does protect us. The spacesuit's, I think, nine layers of materials. So uh, we, we definitely know it's getting hotter or colder, but you don't, you, know, you don't feel that temperature swing thickness. Um, and generally, when you're working out there, you try to stay on the cold side. All right, think about this, because if you start sweating, what can you do about it? Nothing, right? It starts dripping down your face. What's your natural reaction? I, I do this every time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right? And so you don't want that. And so we have a cooling knob on our suit. Uh, we don't have a heating knob, but we have cooling that you can kind of dial it from zero to 10. And uh, we kind of generally, I left it kind of in the middle. And then I would know, like, if I really started to sweat and I was just working too hard, I needed to throw it back the work I was doing. And that was a good barometer for me there. Uh, but, and sometimes if, you, if you're on the dark side and it's minus 200 and you're not doing a whole lot of work for whatever reason, your hands can get pretty cold, um, for sure. A lot of people have hands and feet to get cold. And you, uh, one thing we do, we do have glove heaters, so you can turn those on and let it heat your fingertips up. Uh, but in general, that's the only heating piece that we have up there. Hey, thanks everybody. I hope you learned a little bit tonight. And, uh, <laughs>